Section 34 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 17 The Rule of Lord Palmerston, The Civil War in America, The Danish Duchies, The Close of an Epoch, 1861 to 1865, Part 2 what was the policy of great britain in this serious european crisis russell was anxious to impose mediation upon the combatants and in the event of the refusal of the german powers to send an english squadron to the baltic and ask napoleon to send a french army to the rhine palmerston disliked the idea of a french army on the rhine and some of his younger colleagues notably lord granville were more conscious than the veterans of the cabinet of the new forces which were already at work in germany and were soon to transform it the queen too was unwilling to discourage that rising german sentiment which had quickened the political imagination of her husband the english people on the contrary stimulated no doubt to sympathy with the danes by the recent arrival in their midst of the sea king's daughter from over the sea the young bride of the prince of wales regarded the german powers as treaty breakers and bullies the fighting in the duchies did not last long the danes hopelessly outnumbered were thrust out of them the powers were induced april twenty fifth to enter into a conference in london and on may twelfth the belligerents agreed to an armistice the conference sat until june twenty fifth but it accomplished nothing the victorious germans were exacting the desperate danes were obstinate accordingly the armistice lapsed fighting was resumed at the end of june but in july the danes sued for peace the preliminaries were signed on august first and the terms were embodied in the treaty of vienna october thirtieth the king of denmark handed over the three duchies to austria and prussia half bismarck's task was accomplished but not the harder half the danes were pushed aside the germanic diet and austria remained the diet still pressed the claims of frederick the eighth the duke of augustenburg austria was virtually compelled to espouse them and bismarck agreed to recognize them on terms which would have made frederick a vassal of prussia frederick of augustenburg refused to accept the duchies on these terms and austria and prussia were on the verge of war bismarck however was not quite ready and at gastein august twentieth eighteen sixty five he papered over the cracks lauenburg was sold to prussia holstein remained in the occupation of austria schleswig in that of prussia the cracks soon reappeared bismarck completed his preparations at biarritz he came to terms with napoleon september eighteen sixty five and he promised venetia to italy april eighteen sixty six in june prussia seceded from the germanic confederation war straightway broke out between herself and the bund and within six weeks not austria only but germany lay prostrate under the rapid blows which prussia delivered after the decisive victory of Königsgratz, the emperor gave up the game, and the Treaty of Prague was concluded on August 23, 1866. Bismarck, having thought out beforehand every move in the diplomatic game, treated Austria with leniency, though she was driven out of the Germanic body. Prussia enlarged and consolidated her own dominions by the annexation of Hanover, hesse kassel schleswig holstein lauenburg nassau and the free city of frankfurt on main and all the german states north of the main accepted her hegemony england preserved throughout these events an attitude of correct neutrality palmerston and russell were strongly tempted to side with denmark though the application of their favourite doctrine of nationality was not in this case free from ambiguity public opinion inclined in the same direction but the queen laboured untiringly to keep this country out of war the queen was accused then and frequently 
of allowing her policy to be swayed by dynastic considerations that she should be solicitous as to the prospects of the princess royal was natural that she allowed her personal anxiety to influence her to the detriment of her own country is untrue often wrote mr gladstone january fourth eighteen sixty four as i have been struck by the queen's extraordinary integrity of mind i never felt it more than on hearing and reading a letter of hers about the danish question her determination in this case as in others not inwardly to sell the truth overbears all prepossessions and longings strong as they are on the german side the seven weeks war naturally caused the queen intense anxiety to avert it she had offered to act as mediator but bismarck roughly rejected the unwelcome suggestion by the issue of it she was distraught her elation at the improvement in the prospects of the crown princess of prussia were balanced by the regret at the extinction of her cousin's kingdom of hanover by the curtailment of the rights of her son-in-law of hesse by sympathy with the princess of wales and above all by increasing exasperation at the methods if not the policy of bismarck how did england stand at the close of this period of continental turmoil lord russell's fierce notes and pacific measures furnish an endless theme for the taunts of those who would gladly see the influence of england in the councils of europe destroyed thus wrote the late lord salisbury in eighteen sixty four sir alexander mallet british minister at frankfort held similar language when reviewing these events in eighteen sixty nine it cannot be doubted he affirmed that england's utter desertion of denmark lowered her national reputation and left a stigma of egotism on the nation that our national interests coincided with the dictates of national honour is no longer open to question there is no use said palmerston in 1863 in disguising the fact that what is at the bottom of the german design is the dream of a german fleet and the wish to get kiel as a german seaport that may be a good reason why they should wish it but it is no reason why they should violate the rights and independence of denmark if any violent attempt were made to overthrow those rights and interfere with that independence those who made the attempt would find in the result that it would not be denmark alone with which they would have to contend bismarck estimated palmerston's brave words at their true value with denmark alone he had to contend kiel passed into the hands of prussia the dream of a german fleet has been realized and the country which in the view of contemporaries deserted denmark in eighteen sixty four is to-day compelled to concentrate her naval power in the north sea and to pay nearly fifty million pounds a year to keep pace with the naval development of her most serious rival before the prussian triumph was assured an epoch-making event had taken place at home lord palmerston's long political career was terminated by his death on october eighteenth eighteen sixty five during the last five years of his life and ministry interest in home politics was almost completely in abeyance lord john russell ever faithful to the enthusiasms of his political youth introduced a reform bill in eighteen sixty but presently withdrew it the subject did not again figure in the ministerial program during lord palmerston's life of the four seats vacated by the defranchisement of the boroughs of st albans and sudbury two were assigned in eighteen sixty one to the west riding and one each to south lancashire and birkenhead while the franchise question was kept to the fore by periodical motions made by mr lock king and mr baines but nothing was done and it was tacitly assumed that so long as palmerston lived nothing would be done the dead calm of domestic politics was ruffled only by mr gladstone's budgets and the serious conflict arising therefrom between the two houses of the legislature the budget of eighteen fifty nine presented no feature of special interest there was an increase of nearly four million five hundred thousand pounds in the army and navy estimates and of more than five hundred thousand pounds for miscellaneous purposes 
to meet this the income tax which ought according to mr gladstone's original purpose to have been on the point of extinction was raised from five pence to nine pence in the pound but if the budget of eighteen fifty nine was otherwise featureless that of eighteen sixty was one of the most important of the century mr gladstone himself spoke of eighteen sixty as the last of what i may call the cardinal or organic years the dominating fact of the fiscal situation was the conclusion of the cobden treaty with france but it was also influenced by the falling in of the long annuities which placed two million one hundred thousand pounds at gladstone's disposal he was resolved that the opportunity should be taken of this happy conjunction to do something for trade in the masses for us the cobden treaty meant in mr gladstone's words a sweep summary entire and absolute of the duty on what are known as manufactured goods from the face of the british tariff silk manufactures gloves watches and artificial flowers were among the manufactured articles entirely freed from duty it meant also the removal of duty from butter cheese eggs tallow oranges nuts and a number of articles of food in eighteen forty five after peel's reforms there remained in the tariff one thousand one hundred and sixty three articles by eighteen fifty nine these had been reduced to four hundred and nineteen the budget of eighteen sixty made a clean sweep of three hundred and seventy one leaving only forty eight of which no more than fifteen would contribute anything substantial to the revenue these were spirits sugar tea tobacco wine coffee cocoa currants timber chicory figs hops pepper raisins and rice thus the budget of eighteen sixty gave nearly universal effect to the following principles number one that neither on raw produce nor on food nor on manufactured goods should any duty of a protective character be charged and number two that the sums necessary to be levied for the purposes of revenue in the shape of customs duty should be raised upon the smallest possible number of articles how would the application of these principles immediately affect the revenue on customs mr gladstone anticipated a loss of just over two million one hundred thousand pounds a sum almost equal to the sum saved on the payment of the annuities but such a result was too easy and too tame for the chancellor of the exchequer he proposed to put an extra one pence on the income tax bringing it up to ten pence and to remit at the cost of one million two hundred thousand pounds the duty on paper and other excise duties the principle of the budget was not unchallenged in the house of commons but a hostile resolution proposed by mr duncan was rejected on february twenty fourth by the substantial majority of one hundred and sixteen when the paper duty repeal bill came on for second reading march twelfth sir william miles moved that as it appears the repeal of the duty on paper will necessitate the addition of one pence in the pound to the property and income tax it is the opinion of this house that such repeal is under such circumstances at the present moment inexpedient in view of the very substantial relief given to indirect taxation it is difficult to resist the conviction that sir william miles was right but the second reading was carried by fifty-three on the third reading however the government majority fell to nine this gave the house of lords its opportunity the commons were more than lukewarm about the repeal of the taxes on knowledge as mr gladstone grandiloquently termed them the cabinet was notoriously divided on the subject on may fifth the prime minister spoke for forty-five minutes against the paper duties bill in the cabinet two days later he wrote to the queen to say that if the house of lords encouraged by the narrow majority in the commons were to throw out the bill they would perform a good public service and the government might well submit to so welcome a defeat however questionable palmerston's ideas of cabinet loyalty it is difficult on the merits of the case to disagree with him plainly his chancellor of the exchequer wanted to go too fast on may twenty first the lords rejected the bill by one hundred and ninety three to one hundred and four palmerston was all for acquiescence but he reckoned without his fiery colleague 
on may twenty sixth and on june thirtieth gladstone delivered to the cabinet two elaborate lectures on the constitutional aspects of the case this proceeding of the lords amounted he affirmed to the establishment of a revisory power over the house of commons in its most vital function long declared exclusively its own and to a divided responsibility in fixing the revenue and the charge of the country for the year and he declared i for one am not willing that the house of commons should hold on sufferance in the nineteenth century what it won in the seventeenth and confirmed and enlarged in the eighteenth accordingly palmerston was obliged with very ill grace to submit on july sixth a series of resolutions to the house of commons the first affirmed that the right of granting aids and supplies to the crown is in the commons alone as an essential part of their constitution and the limitation of all such grants as to matter manner measure and time is only in them the second while admitting that the lords had sometimes exercised the power of rejecting bills relating to taxation by negativing the whole nevertheless affirmed that the exercise of that power hath not been frequent and is justly regarded by this house with peculiar jealousy as affecting the right of the commons alone to grant supplies and to provide the ways and means for the service of the year the third grimly foreshadowing future action stated that to guard for the future against an undue exercise of that power by the lords and to secure to the commons their rightful control over taxation and supply this house has in its own hands the power so to impose and remit taxes and to frame bills of supply that the right of the commons as to the matter manner measure and time may be maintained inviolate the commons of course assented to these resolutions and for the moment the excitement died down but the chancellor of the exchequer was not content with the platonic affirmation of a principle to him the action of the lords was a gigantic innovation in eighteen sixty one came the counterstroke by an innovation not less gigantic he embodied the financial proposals of the year not as heretofore in a number of separate bills but in a single bill in which he included the rejected paper duty repeal bill and sent it up to the lords for acceptance or rejection as a whole this procedure was deliberately adopted in order to challenge and if possible to defeat the concurrent though not coordinate rights of the lords in regard to finance this was the moment at which if at all the lords should have made their stand in eighteen sixty the position they adopted was relatively weak in eighteen sixty one they were challenged on grounds not merely defensible but constitutionally impregnable we have it in our power said lord derby to divide the bill which has been sent up to us by that house and so divided we have it in our power to adopt it and to send it back to the commons for acceptance or rejection nevertheless despite the fact that the commons had approved gladstone's innovation only by a majority of fifteen lord derby counselled acquiescence the lords gave way and permitted the commons henceforward to wield a weapon forged by the indomitable will of the chancellor of the exchequer apart from the revolution in procedure the budget of eighteen sixty one was remarkable only for the repeal of the taxes upon knowledge one penny was also taken off the income tax but greatly to his chagrin mr gladstone was compelled to assent to a loan of nine million pounds to be expended gradually upon fortifications in the three following years he did but enlarge and extend the principles affirmed in eighteen sixty the success of those principles was indubitable despite the cotton famine despite a reduction of no less than eight million pounds in british exports to the united states both trade and revenue exhibited remarkable elasticity in the triennium eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty two british exports had averaged only seventy two million pounds in eighteen fifty three through eighteen fifty nine they averaged one hundred and nineteen million pounds in eighteen sixty through eighteen sixty six 
no less than one hundred and forty nine million five hundred thousand pounds while in the last year eighteen sixty six they reached a sum of one hundred and eighty eight million pounds the total foreign trade which in eighteen sixty was three hundred and seventy five million pounds was five hundred and thirty four million pounds in eighteen sixty six in times of such abounding national prosperity the people looked naturally for some relief from the burden of taxation and they did not look to mr gladstone in vain in eighteen sixty three he took two pence off the income tax thus reducing it to seven pence and at the same time he reduced the tea duty from seventeen pence to one shilling in eighteen sixty four the income taxpayers were relieved of another penny and in eighteen sixty five of a further tuppence the tax being thus brought down to fourpence simultaneously the tea duty was reduced from one shilling to sixpence the five years eighteen sixty two through eighteen sixty six showed aggregate remissions of no less than thirteen million five hundred thousand pounds but an abounding revenue did not make mr gladstone careless either as to the equities of taxation or as to the objects and aggregates of expenditure thus in eighteen sixty three he attempted though unsuccessfully to persuade the house to bring charities within the sphere of the income tax his speech on that occasion contained one of the most closely reasoned arguments ever addressed to the house of commons but reason yielded to sentiment more important was the establishment in eighteen sixty one of the post office savings bank mr gladstone himself classed this among the most notable achievements of his political life and its beneficent results none can question it provided for the savings of the people with safety cheapness and convenience and it provided the minister of finance with a strong financial arm and secured his independence of the city by giving him a large and certain command of money the post office savings bank affords one more illustration of mr gladstone's constant solicitude for the promotion of private no less than public economy the growth of public expenditures he viewed with the gravest alarm between eighteen fifty three and eighteen sixty one it was increased from fifty six million to seventy two million pounds in eighteen sixty six he had the satisfaction of having reduced it to sixty six million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds but it was a herculean task it is more difficult he wrote to cobden to save a shilling than to spend a million he was fighting however for a principle which to him was not merely economic but ethical and in such a crusade there was no withstanding the fiery zeal of mr gladstone all excess in public expenditure beyond the legitimate wants of the country is he insisted not only a pecuniary waste but a great political and above all a great moral evil and it was his firm conviction that the spirit of expenditure would never be exorcised and give place to the old spirit of economy so long as we have the income tax how accurate was his diagnosis how shrewd his prediction is shown to all who have come after but his was the voice of one crying in the wilderness neither from his colleagues nor from the house at large did he get effective support alone he did it the whole of my action in eighteen fifty nine through eighteen sixty five he wrote long afterwards was viewed with the utmost jealousy by a large minority and a section of the very limited majority one other reform effected by gladstone though dating from eighteen sixty six may be conveniently noticed here by the exchequer and audit act of that year he completed the circuit of the control of the house of commons not merely over revenue but over expenditure the controller and auditor-general himself the creature of this act is the pivot upon which the whole working of the financial machinery now turns he is a non-political official whose complete independence is secured by the fact that his salary is charged upon the consolidated fund and that he is not permitted to sit in parliament all money collected by the fiscal officials inland revenue post office and woods and forest commissions is paid into the exchequer account at the bank of england and the bank of ireland 
not a penny can be withdrawn from that account without the sanction of this potent individual who presents annually to parliament an audited account together with a report in which it is shown that the sums voted by the house of commons to the several enumerated purposes have been expended strictly upon them and not otherwise before the exchequer and audit act became law the regime against which mr gladstone had so long chafed had for ever passed away parliament having run for six years was dissolved in july eighteen sixty five the general election which ensued increased the normal majority of the government from forty to sixty but the numerical results were less significant than the personal lord palmerston himself was returned for tiverton but the increase of strength on the ministerial benches was more apparent upon the left than upon the right wing john stuart mill a philosophical radical was induced to become a candidate for westminster and was elected the city returned four liberals with mr goshen at the head of them and thomas hughes author of tom brown and a friend of kingsley and morris was returned for lambeth most significant of all mr gladstone was defeated for the university of oxford by mr gathorne hardy and was promptly elected for south lancashire the last real tie between mr gladstone and his pristine conservatism was thus abruptly severed he stood before the country as an unmuzzled radical almost at the same moment there disappeared the most outstanding landmark of the passing era not until the session of eighteen sixty five did lord palmerston exhibit any palpable sign of failing health in june of eighteen sixty four he rode down to harrow for the speeches within the hour and on his eightieth birthday october twentieth eighteen sixty four he spent the greater part of the day in his saddle inspecting the portsmouth fortifications but in eighteen sixty five he was clearly failing his old enemy the gout flew to the bladder he caught a chill while driving out and within two days of completing his eighty-first year he suddenly passed away october eighteenth eighteen sixty five on october twenty seventh his body was committed to the companionship of the mighty dead in westminster abbey the death of lord palmerston had a twofold significance in the first place it closed a great epoch in english history more distinctly even than the reform act of eighteen thirty two it ended the era of the whig ascendancy the period during which england was ruled by a group of great families who brought into power by the revolution of sixteen eighty eight were nominally dethroned by that of eighteen thirty two not that lord palmerston was a typical whig he was not concerned like his colleague and rival lord john russell to exalt the glories of the revolution of sixteen eighty eight nor did he share his belief in the divine right of the whig families to exclusive political power still less was he a typical tory least of all was he a radical he had nothing in common with the priggish liberalism of the benthamites nor with the more democratic sympathies of some of his younger colleagues politically indeed it is not very easy to label him perhaps it is enough to say that his true political progenitor was george canning and that a corner of his own mantle fell upon disraeli like canning he was an ardent liberal in foreign politics a determined foe to continental absolutism a devoted friend of oppressed or struggling nationalities he was the creator of belgium the patron of greece the friend of italy like canning he was an intense believer in the might and the majesty of england and in her obligation as well as her power to maintain the cause of justice among nations meddlesome high-handed and overbearing so he was regarded by the diplomatists especially by the reactionary diplomatists of the continent it was the inevitable judgment on one who deemed it to be the mission of great britain in season and out of season to succour the weak and defend the right 
that he failed to do this in 1862 and 1863 cannot be denied. But three things must be remembered. That Palmerston was not personally at the Foreign Office, that his powers were not what they had been in the 40s, and finally, that there had arisen in Central Europe a diplomatist for whom Palmerston, even at his best, would have been no match. As regards domestic politics, he was most in sympathy with the humanitarian Toryism of his friend, Lord Shaftesbury. To this fact his tenure of the Home Office bore testimony. It proved, too, his excellence as an administrator. But it is as a foreign minister, not as a domestic reformer, that Palmerston will be remembered. Nevertheless, his removal marks the close of a distinct era in our domestic policy. His unquestioned personal supremacy, his superb common sense, and his unfailing tact harmonized conflicting elements and checked the spirit of innovation. His death liberated forces, which he had more or less consciously controlled, and left the door open to Gladstonian radicalism. Palmerston's death did more than close an epoch. It removed from the stage of English politics its most attractive, if not its most striking, personality. As a man, he was extraordinarily winning, perfect in temper, unfailingly good-humoured, splendidly courageous, invincibly optimistic. He never knew when he was beaten, and really beaten he never was. Confident in himself, and proud of the confidence which he inspired in his countrymen, he was absolutely devoid of that self-consciousness and restlessness which tortured some of his more conscientious colleagues. He took all the blows of adverse fortune with equanimity, and he never bore a grudge. Dismissed from the Foreign Office in 1851, he cheerfully accepted an inferior post in the coalition of 1852. On the fall of Lord Derby in 1859, he was willing to serve under his young colleague Lord Granville, though the latter had supplanted him at the Foreign Office. Such magnanimity is as rare in politics as it is admirable. That Palmerston had the defects of his qualities is undeniable. Convinced of the justice of his own position and conscious of the disinterestedness of England, he was too careless of the susceptibilities of other countries. In his dealings with the sovereign he was at times impatient and inconsiderate. Why anyone, least of all a lady, should want to interfere with the business of the Foreign Office while Palmerston was in control, he was quite honestly and simply at a loss to comprehend. For the Queen's character and intellect he had a genuine respect, but he disliked her meddling in what he conceived to be his business. The Queen on her side deplored his levity and was probably misled by his manner. He had not the gravity of a Peel or an Aberdeen or a Gladstone. Like Canning, he had too much of the Irishman in him, and to the last he never ceased to be a schoolboy. But he was more serious than he pretended to be or let others suppose. In Parliament for nearly sixty years, in office for nearly fifty, he was an indefatigable worker and yet never let work damp his high spirits or affect his genial temper. That was surely a great achievement. It was better than an achievement. It was part of the endowment of the man, the Celtic admixture in his blood and his splendid physical equipment. Palmerston resolutely refused to grow old, and he died in harness. He was one of the happy few who are born young, and to the end he preserved the dew of his youth. End of section 34《Section 35 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 18 The Leap in the Dark The Advent of Democracy, 1865 to 1868, Part 1. Has England at any time enjoyed a better constitution? 
than that which subsisted between the reform bill of eighteen thirty two and that of eighteen sixty seven many competent judges have answered this question with an emphatic negative nevertheless that constitution was about to undergo with the concurrence of both the great parties in the state profound modification for many years past the ascendancy of lord palmerston had imparted to english politics a sense of stability this tranquillity was purchased somewhat affirm at the price of legislative sterility be that as it may sleeping dogs were certainly allowed to lie it was otherwise during the period upon which we now enter the twenty years which followed the death of lord palmerston witnessed changes far-reaching in scope and bewildering in rapidity consequently the england of eighteen eighty five was separated by a wide gulf from that of eighteen sixty five the most obvious change was the democratization of the electorate if not of the legislature the reform act of eighteen thirty two had added only four hundred and fifty five thousand votes to the electoral roll and had in some cases actually operated as a measure of disfranchisement the acts of eighteen sixty seven and eighteen eighty four added more than three million demos had at last come into his kingdom not less remarkable was the way in which social and industrial problems gradually but insistently began to demand solution to this fact the statute book bears eloquent testimony the provision for elementary education eighteen seventy the legalization of trade unions eighteen seventy one through eighteen seventy six factory and workshops acts the artisan's dwelling and other public health acts the agricultural holdings acts eighteen seventy five and eighteen eighty three the employers liability act eighteen eighty are examples selected almost at random to illustrate this truth the irish problem also enters upon a new stage almost quiescent since the fiasco of eighteen forty eight it thrusts itself into prominence again in eighteen sixty five under the guise of fenianism the fenian movement inaugurates a period of remedial legislation ecclesiastical and agrarian a period which culminates in the attempt foiled by the electorate to alter fundamentally the constitutional relations of ireland and the united kingdom all this is before us in the twenty years which ensued on lord palmerston's death even more marked is the change in the sphere of foreign policy this was peculiarly the domain of palmerston for more than thirty years he had dominated the foreign office but the ensuing period witnessed more than the removal of a vigorous personality it revealed a profound change in the centre of political gravity from eighteen fifteen to eighteen sixty five great britain was pre-eminently a great european power in the settlement of eighteen fifteen she had played a great part in the solution of the problems to which that settlement gave birth her voice was powerful if not predominant by eighteen seventy one these problems were mostly solved greece and belgium had been erected into independent kingdoms france after trying many experiments in legitimacy in citizen monarchy and in imperialism had settled down into republicanism the house of savoy had consolidated the disunited kingdoms duchies and republics of italy into a unitary kingdom all the german states save only the german lands of austria had united in a federal empire under the presidency of prussia these were the matters which bulked largest in the view of the diplomatists of the palmerstonian era since eighteen seventy one the centre of gravity has shifted more particularly for great britain our concern is less with europe than with asia america and australia we are absorbed in weltpolitik 
with the beginnings of these momentous changes this and the succeeding chapters will be concerned the instability resulting from the removal of lord palmerston is strikingly illustrated by the rapid succession of ministries no less than four prime ministers held office in the three years following palmerston's death the first of these was earl russell to whom as to an old and tried friend the queen naturally turned but the change of premier involved few changes in the cabinet lord westbury had resigned the chancellorship in july in consequence of a vote of censure passed against him by the house of commons for certain more than ordinarily disreputable jobs the great seal had then passed to lord cranworth who had held it in palmerston's first ministry and now retained it under russell the foreign office was once more committed to the safe and experienced hands of lord clarendon mr gladstone became leader of the lower house and early in eighteen sixty six the cabinet was reinforced by two recruits both destined to eminence lord hartington who took the war office and mr goschen whose brilliant financial ability was recognized by the attainment of a cabinet rank at the early age of thirty-four it was assumed on all hands that lord russell's resumption of the first place in the ministry would be signalized by an attempt to reopen the question of parliamentary reform and not without reason but the public mind was in the first months of the new ministry exercised far less about reform than about the cattle plague and the methods employed by governor eyre and his lieutenants for the suppression of insurrection in jamaica in october eighteen sixty five serious riots broke out among the negroes in the island of jamaica martial law was promptly proclaimed and the insurrection if it can be dignified by the term was speedily and effectually suppressed the governor mr e j eyre had earned the reputation by work among the aborigines of australia not merely of a just and capable but of a pre-eminently humane administrator the methods employed in putting down the jamaica insurrection were however of doubtful legality and unquestionable cruelty four hundred and thirty-nine persons including a certain colored baptist preacher named gordon were put to death under martial law six hundred persons including a number of women were mercilessly flogged and one thousand houses belonging to negroes were burned as soon as the news reached england a loud outcry arose chiefly owing to the tone of unpardonable levity and callousness exhibited in the letters of the young officers employed in the suppression of the riots a deputation of the usual sort but of unusual size waited upon mr cardwell the colonial secretary cardwell promptly sent out a strong commission consisting of sir henry storks governor of malta and two eminent barristers and pending the receipt of their report superseded governor eyre parliament at the request of the colonial legislature suspended the constitution of jamaica and reduced the island to the status of a crown colony february eighteen sixty six the report of the commissioners was published with commendable alacrity in april eighteen sixty six they found that the rising had been of a serious character but that martial law had been continued longer than was necessary that the punishments inflicted were excessive and the burning of houses wanton and even cruel eyre was consequently recalled sir john peter grant a distinguished indian civil servant was appointed to succeed him and the island soon resumed its normal condition in august eighteen sixty six eyre arrived in england and at once found himself the centre of a storm area exaggerated abuse on one side equally exaggerated adulation on the other the house of commons adopted a resolution embodying the findings of the commission but the government wisely declined to prosecute air outraged humanity could not however let the matter rest a jamaica committee was formed under the chairmanship of j s mill 
who was supported by Herbert Spencer, Huxley, and Goldwyn Smith. On the other side, Carlyle, Ruskin, and Tennyson were prominent members of the Air Defense Committee. The Shropshire magistrates issued a warrant for the arrest of Air on the charge of being an accessory to murder, but refused to send him for trial. A London magistrate, however, sent for trial Lieutenant Brand, R.N., who presided over the court-martial on Gordon and Brigadier Nelson, who confirmed the sentence. But the grand jury, despite an exhaustive charge from Chief Justice Cockburn, described by Carlyle as six hours of eloquent imbecility, ignored the bill. Not to be foiled of their vengeance, the Jamaica Committee at last, June 1867, got a mandamus under which Eyre was brought up to Bow Street, and had the satisfaction of seeing him sent for trial. The grand jury ignored the bill. In a civil action brought against him for damages, Eyre was equally successful, and in 1872 the government repaid him the heavy expenses to which he had been put by the various and protracted legal proceedings. Two years later he was pensioned, and his career as a public servant was thus abruptly terminated. The net result was not unsatisfactory. The somewhat vindictive impulses of the obtrusive humanitarians were foiled, but on the other hand, a salutary lesson was read to British administrators in distant lands. They learnt, once for all, that the constitutional rights of British subjects, even though they belong to an inferior race, are not to be overridden or ignored. On February 6th, 1866, the Queen opened the first session of the new Parliament elected in the summer of 1865. This was the first occasion on which, since the death of the Prince Consort, the Queen had personally taken part in the ceremony. The speech from the throne was not a cheerful pronouncement. It referred not only to the troubles in Jamaica, but to the prevalence of cattle disease in England and the existence of a formidable conspiracy in Ireland. To the genesis and history of Fenianism, reference will be made later. Here it must suffice to say that the session was barely a fortnight old before the government deemed it necessary to hold a Saturday sitting of both houses to pass a bill for the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act in Ireland. So pressing was the danger that the bill passed through all its stages in both houses in one day, and received the royal assent in the early hours of Sunday, February 17th. Hardly less alarming than the Fenian conspiracy in Ireland was the spread in England of the cattle disease of Rinderpest. This terrible scourge made its appearance among the cattle of some London dairymen in midsummer, 1865. From London it spread with appalling rapidity. By the middle of October, 21 counties in England were affected, two in Wales and 16 in Scotland. Before Parliament met in February, 120,000 cases had been reported, of which 90,000 had proved fatal. The measures taken by the executive under orders in council had proved wholly inadequate, and Parliament, therefore, was compelled to legislate. The most effective remedy would have been the absolute prohibition of the transfer of cattle by road or rail during the continuance of the epidemic and the substitution of a dead meat trade for one in live cattle. But for so drastic a change of custom, the country was not in the sixties prepared. In the event, the carriage of cattle by rail was prohibited until March 25th. All imported cattle were to be slaughtered on landing except those from Ireland, which was entirely immune from disease, and provision was made for the destruction of all beasts actually diseased or exposed to contact. On the subject of compensation, there was a battle royal among the economists, J. S. Mill and Robert Lowe, leading the rival factions. Ultimately, it was decided that in the case of animals actually stricken with the plague, half the value not exceeding twenty pounds should be paid, and in the case of contacts, three-quarters of the value not exceeding twenty-five pounds. 
In both cases, the charge was to fall upon the local rates. These measures were effective, and the grievous murrain gradually abated. It had affected different parts of the country in curiously varying degree. Ireland was totally exempt, Wales almost entirely. It was worst in the northwest, and on the dairy farms of Cheshire, many ancient pastures had to be put under the plough. The total losses were estimated at no less than three million five hundred thousand pounds, but in the long run the visitation was not devoid of salutary results. Sanitary precautions were more generally enforced, and dairy cattle were placed under more effective supervision. Epidemic disease was not confined to the herds. Several of the months of 1866 proved exceptionally unhealthy for human beings, and the summer was marked by a serious outbreak of cholera. While the agricultural interest was suffering from the cattle plague, the financial world was plunged into gloom by a crisis of unusual severity. On Thursday, May 10th, a great firm of bill discounters, Messrs. Overend, Gurney and Company, stopped payment with liabilities of nineteen million pounds. Dismay spread through the city, and the day following the failure of Overend and Gurney is still memorable as Black Friday. The crash was due to overspeculation stimulated by the facilities afforded by the legalization of the principle of limited liability. Between 1855 and 1862 there were passed a series of joint stock company acts which have done much to revolutionize the conditions of English commerce and finance. Few acts passed in the Victorian era have had more far-reaching and, in some sense, more unexpected results. The first effect was an immense stimulus to speculation. Overend and Gurney were only one, though the greatest, of some 250 firms which had recently registered themselves under the Joint Stock Acts. The rate of discount was raised from 3% in June of 1865 to 8% 8 in the succeeding January, but the warnings of the bank were vain. The crash came in May. The failure of Overend and Gurney was followed by a murrain of bankruptcies. The English Joint Stock Bank, the Imperial Mercantile Credit Association, the Consolidated Discount Company were among the earliest defaulters. Great railway contractors like Sir Morton Pito and Company followed in the wake of the bankers and financiers. Government, as in 1848 and 1857, was compelled to come to the rescue of the bank. On May 11th, the bank had advanced over four million pounds to approved customers, and its reserves were dangerously depleted. The Charter Act was accordingly suspended, but public confidence was rapidly restored, and the bank found it unnecessary to act upon the permission accorded by the executive. The discount rate of 10% imposed by the government upon the bank as the condition of additional powers of issue was maintained from May 11th to August 17th. Fortunately, the crisis was financial rather than commercial, and the effects, therefore, were relatively transitory. But a severe shock was administered to the infant principle of limited liability from which it took time to recover. It might have been better had the recovery been even more gradual. No disasters or alarms could quench the septuagenarian affection of Lord Russell for his first love. Firms might totter and herds be decimated. Colonial governors might execute Negroes and Fenians might weave their webs of conspiracy. But the bounds of freedom must be widened and the House of Commons be reformed. The question of parliamentary reform was in the 50s and 60s almost entirely academic. It was raised by the a priori speculations of philosophical liberalism rather than by democratic demand. The machine was, by general consent, working well. Its legislative products, though sparse in quantity, were carefully conceived and have for the most part stood the test of experience. But efficient machinery is not everything. Great urban populations were springing up, 
and little was being done for their education and citizenship. Mostly compound householders, they were serving no apprenticeship to the craft of politics by participation in local government. Out of a total of 5,300,000 adult males in England and Wales, only 900,000 enjoyed the parliamentary franchise. The new reform bill was introduced by Mr. Gladstone on March 12th. It dealt only with the franchise and was commended to the House as a simple and modest measure. It proposed to reduce the borough franchise to seven pounds, estimated on the rental, not the rateable value, and the county franchise to fourteen pounds, to enfranchise lodgers, compound householders, and depositors in savings banks who had had fifty pounds continuously to their credit for two years. Finally, it proposed to deal with a serious and increasing danger by the disfranchisement of government employees in the dockyards. The estimate was that it would add 400,000 votes to the register. Moderate as the proposals appear in the light of later events, they were vehemently attacked at the time as dangerously democratic. It was Robert Lowe who, in Gladstone's phrase, really supplied the whole brains of the opposition. During this year indeed, and this year only, he had such a command of the House as had never, even in Gladstone's experience, been surpassed. Lowe gathered round him a band of stalwart critics nicknamed by Bright the Adulamites. Footnote. From the biblical phrase, for the broken men who rallied around David in the cave of Adulam, every one that was in distress and every one that was discontented, End footnote. And the cave proved formidable. Lord Grosvenor, one of the leaders of the cave, asked the House to decline to proceed with the franchise bill until the scheme for redistribution was laid before it. In a House of 631 members, the Ministry escaped defeat on Lord Grosvenor's amendment only by a majority of five, April 27th. On this point, therefore, the government gave way and carried to a second reading a redistribution bill. It proved to be of a very unambitious character. Forty-nine small boroughs were to lose a member apiece. The English county representation was to be increased by 26. Four additional members were to be given to London, seven to Scotland, five of the largest cities were to get an extra member, and six new boroughs and the University of London were to be enfranchised for the first time. The aggregate number of members would therefore be unchanged. There was no real driving power, either parliamentary or popular, behind the bills, and on June 18th the government were beaten by 315 against 304 on an amendment moved by Lord Dunkelin, who proposed to substitute rateable value for gross rental as a basis for the borough franchise. In consequence of this defeat, the Ministry at once tendered their resignation to the Queen. The Queen saw matters in much truer perspective than the Prime Minister. On the very day on which Russell's government was defeated, Prussia had declared war upon Austria and the German Bund. Central Europe was in consequence threatened with profound convulsion. In this war, two of the Queen's sons-in-law, the Crown Prince of Prussia and the Duke of Hesse-Darmstadt, were fighting on opposite sides, and many others of her kinsmen were in the field. But it was not private anxieties which mainly oppressed her. Always averse to war, she perceived clearly the issues which this particular war must necessarily raise. She therefore urged her ministers to reconsider their decision to resign. In the present state of Europe, she wrote, and the apathy which Lord Russell himself admits to exist in the country on the subject of reform, the Queen cannot think it consistent with the duty which ministers owe to herself and the country that they should abandon their posts in consequence of their defeat on a matter of detail, not of principle, in a question which can never be settled unless all sides are prepared to make concessions. Lord Russell acknowledged the force of the Queen's objections to a change of ministry in the midst of a foreign crisis, 
but overborne perhaps by Gladstone, ultimately persisted in resignation. The Queen was angry and hurt by what she regarded as a desertion. Lord Russell's resignation brought to a close a long and distinguished political career. He survived, indeed, until 1878. But during the last twelve years of his life he took little part in public affairs, and his death removed only the shadow of a mighty name. He had been a member of the legislature with brief intermissions for sixty-five years. He was elected to the House of Commons two years before the Battle of Waterloo. He vacated his place in the House of Lords in the year when Lord Beaconsfield brought back peace with honor from Berlin. He was recognized as the leader of the Whigs on the reform question before George III died, and was admitted to the cabinet in the second year of William IV. Did the greatness of his achievements correspond to the length of his service? He was an admirable administrator, an extraordinarily copious legislator, and an effective debater. Nor can it be questioned that he was at once a sincere friend of humanity and a genuine patriot. There is one thing worse, he said, than the cant of patriotism, and that is the recant of patriotism. This brilliant epigram flung out as a retort to Sir Francis Burdett reflected Russell's genuine conviction. But with all his great qualities and important achievements, it is difficult to feel assured that the ultimate judgment of history will give to Lord Russell a place in the small first class of English statesmanship in which Walpole and Chatham, Pitt and Peel are indisputably included. His domestic life was happy, and he enjoyed the affectionate regard of kinsmen and friends. But to the world in general he gave the impression of shyness and aloofness, and he was tortured by a self-consciousness and restlessness which made him a difficult colleague. Footnote. Lord Selborne's admirable judgment is worth quoting. Lord Russell was very much under the government of popular impulses, prone to sudden and unexpected movements and stratagems in politics, and not proof against the craving for power. To serve under him was easy, for he was just and generous to his followers, but it was difficult for him, after he had once been a leader, to serve under others. Ambitious as he was, he had the self-command to apply to himself the maxim that a wise man ought to retire voluntarily before others perceive that he is too old to govern. Memorials, Part 2, Volume 1, pages 40 and 41, and footnote. He was a keen student of literature, especially of constitutional history, and his own contributions to it were not unimportant. His dispatches and more elaborate political memoranda are stiff and pedantic in style, contrasting unfavorably with the trenchant directness, the homely wit, and brusque common sense of Lord Palmerston. Nevertheless, he played for more than half a century a distinguished and a transparently honorable part in the public life of England, indeed of Europe, and his retirement created a void which was not soon or easily filled. End of section 35section 36 of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 18 the leap in the dark the advent of democracy 1865 to 1868 part 2 on lord russell's final resignation the queen called upon lord derby to form a ministry for the third time he responded to the call. He could not command any more than he could in 1852 or 1858 a majority in the House of Commons, and he sought therefore with complete constitutional propriety to form a ministry not exclusively conservative in composition. 
lord clarendon and the duke of somerset though strongly appealed to declined to retain office and the adullamites would not serve under lord derby though they would have been willing to serve under lord stanley an endeavour to secure the adhesion of lord shaftesbury was equally unsuccessful in the event lord derby was compelled to rely entirely on his own party nevertheless the cabinet was in personnel far stronger than that of eighteen fifty eight lord stanley replaced at the foreign office lord malmesbury who contented himself modestly with the privy seal and four important recruits were included in the cabinet lord cranbourne the lord salisbury of after years took the india office lord carnarvon became secretary for the colonies sir stafford northcote went to the board of trade and mr gathorn hardy to the poor law board disraeli again became chancellor of the exchequer and led the house of commons no sooner were the whigs out and the conservatives in than the people or a noisy section of them awoke to the fact that they were being defrauded of their political rights associations and leagues for the promotion of parliamentary reform sprang into existence the most important of them the reform league having held a demonstration in trafalgar square on july second announced its intention of organizing another demonstration in hyde park on july twenty third the police acting on the orders of the government announced that the gates of the park would be closed on that day at five o'clock accordingly when the procession arrived at the park they found it closed against them the leaders having demanded in vain that the gates should be opened withdrew quietly to trafalgar square where the meeting was held but though the actual demonstrators departed the mob lingered broke down the railings and swarmed into the park itself a conflict ensued between the mob and the police the guards were summoned but before they could arrive the riot was over and order was restored the league and their chairman mr beales were anxious to test the legality of the action of the government but no opportunity was given the legal aspect of the matter is however clear enough the park is the property of the crown and the crown can close it if the public is admitted at all there is nothing to prevent them from holding a meeting provided they do not otherwise bring themselves into conflict with the law a reform demonstration was held without interference in the park in the following may there was a general feeling that the government had bungled on this question and they found a scapegoat in the person of mr spencer walpole the home secretary in may of eighteen sixty seven walpole resigned his portfolio to mr gathorn hardy a distinguished lawyer who had in eighteen sixty five defeated mr gladstone at oxford meanwhile mr john bright had been conducting a reform campaign in the provinces during the autumn great meetings were held at manchester birmingham leeds edinburgh glasgow and many other towns in all a thousand such meetings were held and on every side there was a clamorous demand for reform bright spared no efforts to inflame it the accession to office of lord derby he affirmed with questionable taste and truth is a declaration of war against the working classes meanwhile the derby disraeli ministry was anxiously considering its position and its policy there was nothing in the recent position of the party to preclude them from an attempt to settle the question of reform but it was their belief as it was that of the queen that it could be settled only by consent by parliament as a whole not by either party accordingly the speech from the throne in february of eighteen sixty seven expressed a hope that the deliberations of parliament on this matter would be conducted in a spirit of moderation and mutual forbearance and lead to the adoption of measures which without unduly disturbing the balance of political power shall freely extend the elective franchise to give effect to these amiable aspirations the cabinet decided to proceed not by bill but by resolution the resolutions thirteen in number proved to be largely truistic they affirmed that the number of electors for counties and boroughs ought to be increased 
that this should be done by reducing the value of the qualifying tenement and by adding other franchises not dependent on such value that the occupation franchise should be based upon the principle of reading that the principle of plurality of votes should be adopted that while it is desirable that a more direct representation should be given to the laboring classes it is contrary to the constitution of this realm to give any one class or interest a predominating power over the rest of the community that redistribution of seats was expedient but that no existing parliamentary borough should be wholly disenfranchised that registration should be improved bribery and corruption prevented and further faculties for polling provided in particular that voters should be permitted to use polling papers for recording their votes how did the government intend to translate these abstract resolutions into concrete proposals this was the question asked on every side and not answered by disraeli until february twenty fifth on that day he introduced a bill to give effect to them the scheme he then expounded was the more moderate of two schemes which the cabinet had for some time past been considering on february twenty third a saturday the cabinet had agreed to the larger scheme during the leisure of sunday lord cranborne had discovered that it was too large for his taste and on february twenty fifth he and lord carnarvon refused to proceed with it an explanation of the ministerial scheme was promised for monday afternoon the cabinet therefore was hastily summoned disraeli produced his smaller scheme the disruption of the ministry was for the moment averted and the smaller scheme was duly presented to the house it included four new and fancy franchises a six-pound rating franchise for boroughs and the reduction of the county franchise from fifty to twenty pound occupiers the changes were estimated to add four hundred thousand voters to the register as for redistribution thirty small boroughs were to lose one member apiece two additional members were to be given to the tower hamlets twelve considerable towns such as burnley barnsley croydon darlington and middlesbrough were to be enfranchised fifteen additional members were to be given to counties and one member to london university the scheme embodied in this ten minutes bill was virtually stillborn it was coldly received by parliament the conservative party professed a preference for the larger scheme and upon the larger scheme therefore disraeli fell back the resolutions were formally withdrawn on february twenty sixth the resignations of lord cranburn lord carnarvon and general peel were announced on march fourth and on the eighteenth disraeli expounded to the house of commons the larger scheme which had been temporarily laid aside in the hope of securing their adhesion it was admittedly a scheme of checks and counterpoises the borough franchise was to be associated with the direct payment of rates every householder paying rates and having resided for two years was to have a vote every one who paid a pound in direct taxes other than licenses was to have a vote if he were also a rate-paying householder he was to have two votes besides these qualifications there were to be three others an education franchise a second based upon the possession of funded property a third on that of a deposit in a savings bank it was estimated that more than one million voters would in all be added to the borough constituencies in counties the rating qualifications were to be fifteen pounds in place of a fifty pound rental which together with the lateral franchises would add it was estimated three hundred and thirty thousand voters to the county register the redistribution proposals were identical with those propounded on february twenty fifth these revised proposals were received with favour by the bulk of the conservative party with caution by mr gladstone and with strong opposition by adulamites like lowe and by the extremer tories such as sir w heathcote and mr beresford hope after two nights debate the bill was read a second time without a division but not before mr gladstone had indicated the scope of the amendments upon which he and his party would insist if with their consent the bill were to become law a larger franchise must be inserted the fancy franchises and the dual vote must go 
the distinction between classes of rate-paying householders must be abolished the county franchise must be further reduced the scheme of voting papers dropped and the redistribution part of the scheme enlarged the later parliamentary career of this famous measure is extraordinarily complicated the confusion arises mainly from the attitude toward the question of the two protagonists to the casual observer that of disraeli appears simply reckless and unprincipled that of gladstone hesitating and cautious whether closer examination will confirm this view remains to be seen this much at least is certain that the radical leaders gladstone and bright were not at that time prepared for household suffrage in all our boroughs said the latter there is a small class which it would be much better for themselves if they were not enfranchised because they have no independence whatever i call this class the residuum we did not wish wrote the former in a retrospective memorandum to make at once so wide a change as that involved in a genuine household suffrage always in our minds involving county as well as town and so we adhered to our idea of an extension considerable but not violent and performing all it promised disraeli on the contrary was not in the least afraid of a leap into the darkness of household suffrage provided he could carry with him a sufficient number of his own party with superb ingenuity he led them to the brink of the abyss by dangling before them the checks and counterpoises in other words the lateral extension of the suffrage and the exclusion of the compound householder in tactics he was always more adroit than his rival and never were the contrasted endowments of the two men more clearly displayed than in that session of eighteen sixty seven before the house got into committee on the bill the radical leaders decided to move an instruction to the committee which would have had the effect of excluding bright's residuum from the suffrage such a motion was in complete accord with their settled convictions but it was a grave tactical blunder a radical cave known as the tea-room party rapidly formed itself and the instructions had to be abandoned but mr gladstone was not to be moved from his set purpose he tabled a series of amendments of which the two most important ones were number one to delete the distinction between direct and indirect ratepayers and thus admit to the franchise compound householders and number two to fix an inferior limit of five pounds rating value and thus exclude all householders whether ratepayers or not of the very lowest class gladstone moved the first of these amendments on april eleventh supporting it on the ground that the bill as it stood would do little for the enfranchisement of the working classes in towns since the occupiers of two-thirds of the houses under the value of ten pounds were compounders the debate revealed the confusion and perplexity into which members of all parties were plunged by the cross-currents of opinion and particularly by the complications of the compound householder on the one hand extreme tories described their leaders proposals not untruthfully as at once niggardly and lavish timid and rash on the other extreme radicals resented the restrictive amendment of which their leader had given notice the house generally did not want a change of ministry involving an inevitable dissolution and did want the settlement of a tiresome and difficult question in the event gladstone was defeated on his first amendment by a majority of twenty-one the result was a staggering blow to his personal prestige and was a conspicuous triumph for the tactics of his rival but the irony of the situation was that the result was achieved merely by the action of the tea-room party who defeated their leader's first amendment because they disliked his second the easter recess followed immediately upon the defeat of mr gladstone it was not unnatural that he should for a moment have contemplated retirement from the leadership of his party the party was notoriously rent by insubordination and intrigue while the leader exhibited a combination of profound earnestness and nervous irritability which matched ill with the sardonic imperturbability of his great rival 
two things perhaps dissuaded mr gladstone from a step which at this stage of his career might have been irrevocable one was the rising tide of democratic fervor in the country and the other was the generous encouragement of john bright the triumph of the tories was short-lived in the later stages of the bill the liberals had it all their own way one by one the counterpoises went by the board the dual vote and the lateral or fancy franchises were abandoned the two years qualifying residence was reduced to one a lodger franchise was inserted the rating qualifications for the county franchise were reduced from fifteen to twelve pounds the voting paper device was deleted one great difficulty remained one barrier still stood between the bill and the household suffrage sans phrase the compound householder this was the last remnant of conservatism left in the bill on this point it seemed impossible that disraeli could yield nor did he his face was saved by the amendment of mr hodgkinson who proposed to solve the difficulty by getting rid of compounding altogether this solution was accepted by the government and by the house the franchise was made in this way to rest upon the principle of personal rating nevertheless the bill had become a bill for household suffrage pure and simple and there was justice in the plaint of lord cranburn that it represented a negation of all the principles professed by his party several interesting amendments were proposed by j s mill one for the enfranchisement of women was received with some hilarity and was rejected by one hundred and ninety six to seventy three but john bright and henry fawcett were with mill in the minority other amendments were intended to provide for the representation of minorities and in particular to recommend mr hare's scheme for proportional representation the reception of these was sympathetic but discouraging and they were withdrawn it was however decided to give a third member to manchester liverpool leeds glasgow and birmingham and a proposal made in the house of lords by lord cairns that in these boroughs and in the three member counties electors should be permitted to vote only for two candidates was despite the strong opposition of mr bright accepted by the commons but this was the only crumb of comfort vouchsafed to minorities the redistribution clauses were also considerably amended taken in conjunction with the reform bills for scotland and ireland eighteen sixty eight the net result was that six boroughs returning two members each and five boroughs returning one were totally disenfranchised and thirty-five other boroughs lost one member each thus fifty-two seats were set free for redistribution of these the boroughs got twenty-two additional members the counties twenty-seven london university one and the scotch universities two the aggregate numbers of the house remained therefore constant the representation of the people bill received the royal assent on august fifteenth eighteen sixty seven a word may be added as to the scotch and irish reform bills which became law in eighteen sixty eight the scotch bill followed the same lines as the english except that the occupation franchise for the counties was fixed at fourteen instead of twelve pounds in ireland the county qualification already stood at twelve pounds and was not therefore altered in eighteen sixty eight the qualification in boroughs was reduced from eight to four pounds the latter being the inferior limit of direct ratepayers lodgers were admitted on the same terms as in england ten pounds a year rental for unfurnished rooms such was the parliamentary reform legislation of eighteen sixty seven eighteen sixty eight the magnitude of the change affected none can gainsay in all some one million eighty thousand persons were enfranchised in the towns notwithstanding the original disclaimer of the principle the act meant the adoption of household suffrage pure and simple loud were the predictions of impending disaster the bag which holds the winds said mr low will be untied and we shall be surrounded by a perpetual whirl of change alteration innovation and revolution your repentance he told disraeli bitter as i know it will be 
will come too late even the conservative premier admitted that the act was a leap in the dark his brilliant lieutenant was entirely unrepentant there was indeed truth as well as point in general peel's bitter avowal that the proceedings in reference to the reform bill had taught him three things first that nothing had so little vitality as a vital point second that nothing was so insecure as a security and third that nothing was so elastic as the conscience of a cabinet minister similarly the splenetic sage of chelsea might bewail the shooting of niagara and might denounce the superlative hebrew conjurer spellbinding all the great lords great parties great interests of england to his hand and leading them by the nose like helpless mesmerized somnambulant cattle to such issue such tirades left disraeli quite unmoved his personal triumph was complete and in his speech on the third reading that note is clear five ministries lord john russell's lord aberdeen's lord palmerston's lord darby's and lord russell's again had attempted to settle the question and had failed what was the position of the conservative government on taking office in eighteen sixty six they were unpledged as to details but they had always claimed that the question of reform was open to them no less than to their opponents in eighteen sixty seven indeed they had no choice having to deal with this question and being in office with a large majority against us and finding that ministers of all colours of party and politics with great majorities had failed to deal with it successfully and believing that another failure would be fatal not merely to the conservative party but most dangerously to the country we resolved to settle it if we could under these circumstances was it not the only reasonable course to take the house into counsel with us and by our united efforts and the frank communication of ideas to attain a satisfactory solution for himself disraeli had always held that if the question were tackled at all it must be tackled boldly that if the settlement of eighteen thirty two were upset there was no resting-place in the borough short of the acceptance of the principle of rated household suffrage can any one now doubt that in this disraeli was right why then did he not in the first instance produce a bill based on this principle this was obviously a question not of principle but of cabinet and parliamentary tactics his colleagues were aware of his opinions they had accepted the principle of household suffrage in eighteen fifty nine though it may well be that nothing but a tactical movement would have induced either the party or the house to take the final plunge the act of eighteen sixty seven gave precise expression to disraeli's lifelong convictions the peroration of his third reading speech in eighteen sixty seven echoes the language and reasserts the principles of coningsby for an oligarchy whether of landlords or merchants disraeli had nothing but contempt like bolingbroke he believed in a patriot king and he desired to see his monarchy broad based upon the people's will that he was unscrupulous in the choice of means may be admitted that he lacked principle or was false to his convictions can be asserted only by those who have not been at pains to understand the one or probe the other it may be convenient before leaving the reform question to notice briefly three changes of some importance which followed hard upon the enactment of the bill of eighteen sixty seven in eighteen sixty eight the lords abandoned a privilege long enjoyed of voting by proxy and concurred with the commons in transferring the trial of election petitions from the house of commons to the judges in eighteen seventy two vote by ballot was substituted for open voting such were the questions upon which the minds of englishmen were for the most part concentrated in the late sixties relatively unnoticed was the passage of a bill of infinitely larger significance while politicians at westminster were wrangling over the ten-pound lodger and the compound householder men of english blood across the seas were initiating an experiment immensely important in its immediate aspect and pregnant with still wider possibilities for the future that experiment 
was embodied in the British North America Act of 1867 and laid the foundation of the Canadian Federation of today, an achievement so remarkable demands a chapter in itself. End of section 36. Section 37 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 19. Colonial and Foreign Policy, The Dominion of Canada, Part 1. The Constitution of the Dominion of Canada is in one respect unique among those of the federal type. It represents the result of forces in part centripetal, but in part also centrifugal. It satisfied the aspirations of the British colonies in North America, or of most of them, for closer union and at the same time the separatist tendencies which had long been manifest in the two Canadas themselves. The two movements, the one disintegrating, the other federal, came to a head with curious simultaneity in 1864. Long before that time, however, it had become apparent that neither the Union Act of 1840 nor the attainment of responsible government was destined to register the final stage in the constitutional evolution of British North America. For this lack of finality, there were several reasons among which two were of preeminent validity. On the one hand, there was obviously much in common between the disunited British colonies, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and more particularly New Brunswick and Upper Canada. On the other hand, there were many elements of disunion between the united colonies of Upper and Lower Canada. The latter were, as a candid historian puts it, obviously ill-matched yoke fellows. Lord Durham had perceived the fact twenty years earlier, but he found it an argument not for federation but for union. The French, wrote Lord Durham, remain an old and stationary society in a new and progressive world. In all essentials they are still French, but French in every respect dissimilar to those of France in the present day. They resemble rather the France of the provinces under the old regime. But while Quebec was rigidly conservative, not to say reactionary, Ontario was, both in a political and economic sense, eminently progressive. Ontario was anxious to attract population. The French Canadians, though themselves prolific, were fearful of losing their identity and discouraged immigration. Consequently, the balance of population between the two provinces rapidly shifted. Quebec in 1841 numbered 691,000 people. Ontario could claim only 465,000. By 1861, the latter had increased to 1,396,000, the former only to 1,111,000. Race, religion, and tradition all combined to keep apart two peoples who had never really united. Among the maritime provinces there was, on the contrary, a strong movement towards closer union, and in 1864 the legislatures of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick agreed to hold a convention for the purpose of discussing the project. Meanwhile, in Canada, a constitutional deadlock had been solved only by the formation in June of 1864 of a coalition ministry pledged to address themselves in the most earnest manner to the negotiation for a federation of all the British North American provinces. In pursuance of this pledge, the Canadian government sought and obtained permission to send delegates to the convention called by the maritime provinces. It met at Charlottetown on September 1st. The project of the larger federation rapidly took shape, and in October a second convention assembled at Quebec. 
Before the month was out, the delegates had agreed upon 72 resolutions which formed the basis of the subsequent Act of Federation. Alexander Galt, George Brown, and George Etienne Cartier must share with John A. MacDonald the credit of this remarkable achievement, but to MacDonald it belongs in preeminent degree. He himself would have preferred to go even farther, believing that if we could agree to have one government and one parliament legislating for the whole of these peoples, it would be the best, the cheapest, the most vigorous, and the strongest system of government we could adopt. But he realized that his own ideal was unattainable. Neither Lower Canada nor the Maritime Provinces were willing to surrender their individuality. They were prepared for union, but not for unity, and MacDonald expressed his belief that in the resolutions they had hit upon the happy medium and had devised a scheme which would give them the strength of a legislative union and the sectional freedom of a federal union with protection to local interests. Many difficulties were encountered, many jealousies had to be appeased, but the scheme was eventually approved by the two Canadas, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and in December 1866, delegates from these colonies met under the presidency of Lord Carnarvon, then Colonial Secretary, in London. A bill embodying the details agreed upon in this conference was submitted to the Imperial Parliament, and on March 29th, 1867, the British North America Act received the royal assent. It came into operation on July 1st of the same year. The Canadian Dominion represents the first federation in world history under the aegis of a constitutional monarchy. The preamble of the Act lays it down that the Dominion Constitution was to be similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. In other words, the constitutional conventions attained after long centuries of evolution in the unwritten constitution of the motherland were presupposed in the statutory instrument devised for the daughterland. The executive power was to continue and to be vested in the queen and in the heirs and successors of Her Majesty, kings and queens of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. On this point, MacDonald laid great stress. With the universal approval of the people of this country, we have provided that for all time to come, so far as we can legislate for the future, we shall have as head of the executive power the sovereign of Great Britain. His hope was in this way to avoid one defect inherent in the Constitution of the United States— by the election of the president by a majority and for a short period, he never is the sovereign and chief of the nation. He is at best but the successful leader of a party. I believe that it is of the utmost importance to have that principle recognized so that we shall have a sovereign who is placed above the region of party, to whom all parties look up, who is not elevated by the action of one party, nor depressed by the action of another, who is the common head and sovereign of all. The sovereign of Great Britain was to be represented in the dominion by a governor-general who was to have the ordinary powers of a constitutional sovereign in the English sense, the command-in-chief of the armed forces of the crown, and the right to appoint and, if necessary, to remove the lieutenant-governors of the provinces of the dominion. He was to be aided and advised by the Queen's Privy Council of Canada. It was clearly understood that this body was to be a parliamentary cabinet on the English model, homogeneous in composition, mutually responsible, politically dependent upon the parliamentary majority, and acting in subordination to an acknowledged leader. But though this was understood and indeed implied by the terms of the preamble, it was not specifically set forth in the Constitution. There was not even a provision such as that in the Australian Commonwealth Act that the members of the Privy Council should be members of the legislature. The number of this cabinet has varied with the growth of new administrative departments 
and now, 1912, consists of 15 members, a Premier President of the Cabinet, a Secretary of State, virtually Minister for Foreign Affairs, a Postmaster General, and 12 ministerial heads of public departments, such as Trade and Commerce, Justice, Finance, Railways and Canals, Labour, Militia and Defence. Legislative power was vested in a Parliament for Canada, consisting of the Queen, an Upper House or Senate, and a House of Commons. The Governor-General was authorized to assent in the Queen's name to bills presented to him in the two Houses, or to withhold the Queen's assent, or to reserve the bill for the signification of the Queen's pleasure. Bills to which the Governor-General had assented might be disallowed by the Queen, by order in Council, at any time within two years after the receipt of an authentic copy of the Act by the Secretary of State. Bills reserved for the Queen's pleasure were not to come into force unless and until, within two years from the day on which it was presented to the Governor-General for the Queen's assent, the Governor-General signified by speech or message to each of the Houses of the Parliament, or by proclamation, that it had received the assent of the Queen in Council. That such reservation was no mere form is clear from the fact that between 1867 and 1877 no less than 21 bills were actually reserved. The Federal Parliament, like the Union Parliament erected in 1840, was to consist of two chambers. Under the Union Act, the Second Chamber of Legislative Council was to consist of not fewer than 20 persons nominated by the Crown for life. But the nominated Second Chamber was not a success and in deference to an agitation more or less persistent, it was decided in 1856 to abandon the nominee system. The existing members of the Council were to be left undisturbed, but vacancies as they occurred were to be filled by election. The experiment of 1856 was not more successful than the nominee system which it superseded. The Federal Act of 1867 reverted to the principle of nomination. The Senate, as then constituted, was to consist of 72 members and was, like that of the United States, to embody and emphasize the federal idea. Quebec, Ontario, and the Maritime Provinces, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, were to be equally represented in the Senate, 24 members being nominated from each. But in subsequent amendments this principle has not been maintained. An act of the Imperial Legislature in 1871 authorized the Dominion Parliament to provide for the due representation in the Senate of any province subsequently admitted to the Federation. Under these powers, four senators each have been assigned to Manitoba, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, and three to British Columbia. The Act of 1867 provided that Prince Edward Island, if it elected to join the Federation, should have four senators. But in this event, the senatorial representation of the other maritime provinces, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, was to be automatically reduced to ten each. The contemplated event having since occurred, the Senate now consists of 87 members apportioned to the several provinces in accordance with the acts enumerated above. Subject to this apportionment, senators were to be nominated for life by the Governor-General, in practice on the advice of his responsible ministers. A senator was to be a, of the full age of thirty years, b, a British subject, c, a resident in the province for which he was appointed, and d, possessed of real property of the net value of not less than $4,000 within the province. He may at any time and under certain contingencies must resign his seat. No direct provision was made in the Act for a deadlock between the two houses, but power was given to the Crown to nominate three or six additional senators representing equally the three divisions of Canada. In 1873, the Canadian Cabinet advised the exercise of this power, 
but the imperial government refused to sanction it on the ground that it was not desirable for the queen to interfere with the constitution of the senate except upon an occasion when it had been made apparent that a difference had arisen between the two houses of so serious and permanent a character that the government could not be carried on without her intervention and when it could be shown that the limited creation of senators allowed by the act would supply an adequate remedy it will be observed that the canadian senate is a cross between several principles which if not absolutely contradictory are clearly distinct consequently it has never possessed either the glamour of an aristocratic and hereditary chamber or the strength of an elected assembly or the utility of a senate representing the federal as opposed to the national idea devised with the notion of giving some sort of representation to provincial interests it has from the first been manipulated by party leaders to subserve the interests of the central executive the house of commons was to consist of one hundred and eighty one members eighty two being assigned to ontario sixty five to quebec nineteen to nova scotia and fifteen to new brunswick quebec was always to retain sixty five members the representation of the other provinces was to be adjusted after each decennial census but in such a way that the representation of each province should bear the same proportions to its population as sixty five bears to that of quebec the house of commons was to sit for five years and was to have the right of originating money bills on the sole recommendation of the executive otherwise the powers of the two houses were to be coordinate in each province there was to be a lieutenant governor appointed by the governor-general and assisted by an executive council the legislature was to consist of two houses in quebec new brunswick nova scotia and one in ontario certain matters were specifically assigned to the provincial legislatures but the residue of powers was vested in the dominion parliament this is a feature of primary importance and it is one which differentiates the canadian constitution alike from that of the united states and from that of the australian commonwealth in the latter it is the federal authority to which certain special powers are delegated by the constituent states and any power which is not so delegated remains vested in the state the canadian solution of this crucial problem is an interesting memorial to the historical circumstances under which the constitution came to birth macdonald as we have seen and many of his more influential colleagues would have preferred a legislative union they were baffled by the centrifugal nationalism of quebec but though accepting the inevitable they were resolved to infuse into canadian federalism as much of unitary cohesion as quebec would tolerate the original constituent provinces of the dominion were as already indicated quebec ontario new brunswick and nova scotia but provision was made in the constitution for the admission of other colonies or territories in particular newfoundland prince edward island and british columbia newfoundland has continued in pride of birth to stand aloof from her younger sisters but hardly had the british north america act come into force july first eighteen sixty seven when resolutions were adopted in the dominion parliament in favour of the union of rupert's land and the northwest territory before the crown could give effect to these resolutions a preliminary arrangement had to be reached between the dominion government and the hudson bay company the latter agreed in consideration of the sum of three hundred thousand pounds and certain reserved tracts of land to surrender its territorial rights to the crown and by order in council june twenty third eighteen seventy rupert's land and the northwest territory was admitted to the union in the same year the province of manitoba was carved out of the territory and was formally admitted a member of the dominion with representation according to population in the canadian house of commons and three senators in the upper house 
these arrangements were confirmed by an act of the imperial parliament in eighteen seventy one and by the same act the right of the dominion parliament to establish provinces in new territories forming part of the dominion was made clear a subsequent act of eighteen eighty six gave the canadian parliament power to provide representation in the senate and house of commons for territories not yet included in any province in nineteen o five two further provinces those of alberta and saskatchewan were carved out of the northwest territory and were admitted with appropriate representation into the dominion long before that in eighteen seventy one british columbia had taken advantage of the provision made in the act of eighteen sixty seven for its admission to the dominion and by order in council may sixteenth eighteen seventy one its admission was formally ratified prince edward island was similarly admitted in eighteen seventy three as yet however the great dominion was very loosely compacted between the maritime provinces on the atlantic littoral and the maritime province which occupies the pacific slope there intervened more than three thousand miles of territory a word must be said presently of the initiation and completion of the great imperial enterprise which has now linked these together in bonds of steel intermediately it is proper to notice a small military expedition arising out of the incorporation of the hudson bay territory that incorporation was not entirely popular with the french canadians and half-breeds who inhabited the country in eighteen seventy a young french canadian louis riel collected a band of indians and half-breeds attacked the stores of the company at fort garry on the red river and proclaimed himself president of the republic of the northwest it was a transient ebullition of discontent and it was dealt with promptly and successfully colonel garnet wolsey was dispatched from toronto in command of a mixed force of fourteen hundred men composed partly of imperial troops partly of canadian militia the march from toronto to fort garry was a difficult one of more than six hundred miles but thanks to the foresight caution and skill of colonel wolsey it was accomplished without the loss of a man no fighting was necessary the president fled into the united states before wolsey arrived at fort garry august order was completely restored and the objects of the expedition were fully attained at a trifling cost of one hundred thousand pounds the scale of the operations was small but the skill with which they were carried out gave promise of powers on the part of the commander abundantly redeemed by a brilliant future the red river rebellion did not interrupt the work of expansion and consolidation in canada to that work the construction of a transcontinental railway was an indispensable adjunct it was indeed a condition of the union between canada and british columbia the government of the dominion so the agreement ran undertakes to secure the commencement simultaneously within two years from the date of the union of the construction of the railway from the pacific toward the rocky mountains and from such point as may be selected east of the rocky mountains toward the pacific to connect the seaboard of british columbia with the railway system of canada and further to secure the completion of such railway within ten years from the date of such union the work of construction ought to have begun in eighteen seventy three as a matter of fact various delays interposed and it was not until eighteen eighty that the great enterprise was actually initiated the contract stipulated that it should be completed by eighteen ninety one but so rapid was the progress that the work was finished in half that time and the line was opened in eighteen eighty six the canadian pacific railway is from every point of view political economic and strategic of the highest significance and deserves to rank among the most imposing imperial achievements of the century its terminals are at montreal and vancouver respectively its total length of line is two thousand nine hundred and nine miles 
or about half the distance which separates Liverpool from Vancouver. Of the engineering difficulties encountered in its construction, some idea may be gleaned from the fact that it crosses the Rocky Mountains at an elevation of 5,560 feet. It was the work of private enterprise, but in order to expedite and encourage its construction, the Dominion government granted to the company a subsidy of five million pounds, together with a land grant of twenty-five million acres, and the privilege of permanent exemption from taxation. No privilege could, however, be too great for an enterprise of such high imperial significance. To enable the farmers of western Canada to feed the mill hands of Lancashire and the miners of South Wales, to bring Liverpool within a fortnight of Vancouver, to unite in commercial and political bonds the Pacific Slope and the Atlantic Littoral, this was the purpose and this was the achievement of the empire builders who planned and constructed the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Of the work of Federation, that railroad was at once the condition and the complement. End of section 37